is the Powerful Nonsense Podcast. Learn everything you need to know to make a living outside the 9 to 5 grind and crush it at life. You'll learn from inspirational guests and in-depth discussions. Go from employee to entrepreneur and start creating a life you love and still pay the bills. So here are your hosts, Wayne Ingram and Jem Yildiz. Let's get on with the show! This podcast is sponsored by the University of Northampton, the first UK university to be awarded the Ashoka U Changemaker Campus status in recognition for their commitment to social entrepreneurship. It's that time of the week again. It's your favourite time of the week. It's powerful nonsense time. Woo! Woo, 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 woo. We're closing out our creativity month. Been a bit of a theme running with our episodes. So if we... you haven't already noticed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you haven't, like... Come on. <laughs> but yeah, so we're closing that off today. But something really cool is happening next month. Yep. Me and Jam are going to Dublin. First powerful nonsense trip. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> we're going to Dublin specifically to meet up with Mansell Denton, who has been on the podcast a couple of times. Um, in fact, in one of my favourite episodes, mm-hmm. was, was his second interview with us, Is It Love or Insecurity? Yeah, was that's the title the of the episode. Oh, get me with my <laughs> good memory there. My uh, archive knowledge. <laughs> but yeah, we've always said that if ever he was over this side of the world, that we'd meet up. He messaged Jem, said, "I'm in Dublin." And about half an hour later, we'd booked our flights and said, "Yep, we're coming." <laughs> uh, and it's cool because I've not been to Ireland yet, and I'm actually of Irish descent, and I've always wanted to uh, head over to Ireland. So I've never been to Ireland either. So. Good yeah, stuff. We'll explore it together. Um, we're discussing. Uh, I haven't warned Gem that I'm going to say this, but we've been discussing possibly like a bonus episode, just me, you, and and Marzel sat round. I think so. Having a discussion. I'd be happy if we can just sip a beer and have a little conversation, yeah. see where it goes with the with the hubbub of Ireland <laughs> behind us. Uh, yeah, so so that might that might appear. So keep your eyes peeled for that. That'll just be a, a nice chilled out. It's be like hanging out with us in Ireland without might, having to be in Ireland. Wayne might be slurring a bit with his words, but <laughs> <laughs> and developed an Irish accent as well. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this episode is not about Dublin. It is not. It is not. Today we're talking about creative decision making. Um, and kind of the lateral thinking that goes along with that and just the sort of general creative process, generally speaking. <laughs> As we're such generalists. <laughs> yes, why not? Um, and, and I think kind of the idea of this episode is just to get a nice little debate conversation going about, like, where is the creative process useful? Where is lateral thinking useful? And whether or not maybe you should just look at ticking boxes. Yeah, because uh, Wayne came up with this idea for this episode and I was kind of like, I, sti- I still don't quite know <laughs> what we're going to be saying about this, but I guess that is part of the creative process, actually just go in yeah. with the flow, see where it leads, iterate, iterate along the way. Yeah, I, you like, like that? I like what you did there. That was a nice little <laughs> segue. Um, but the idea of the episode actually came from a video, which I saw. Uh, we'll which link was, to in the show notes. Yeah, it's kind of a Bill Burnett, I think, was the guy at Stanford University who was talking about, um, you know, the difference between um, design, uh, sorry, decision making in design and decision making in other fields. And he was basically saying that um, the difference is that in like business, you you often make decisions based on data Mm -hmm. um, or you make decisions based off solving a problem. But when you're in a design situation, you don't really have the data to back up any design because it's, it's a qualitative thing rather than a quantitative thing. Um, and you're not necessarily solving a problem. Um, he talks about, you know, the difference between making a fast phone because you want to de- design a fast phone or the way that Apple does it, which is, let's see, we're four minutes in and Apple's already come up. <laughs> <laughs> but he said this, not me. Um, so, yeah, it's making a fast phone or whether you're making a, an object of desire, which is what Apple chooses to do. And... The different approaches are so very different because if you end up trying to make an object of desire, you end up with a very different outcome to if you're just trying to make a fast phone. Because you can make a fast phone, but it could look hideously ugly. Is this kind of long the idea then for somebody who's creating a business? So someone says, oh, I want to start a business. So they start looking at trends. Like everyone's like, oh, health trends and Mm -hmm. transport trends. So they're looking at the data in terms of creating a business. And then Uh is, is the other side of that somebody who's maybe 
looking at a business from a passion. It's kind of like, well, I enjoy this and I'm just going to put it out there because I haven't looked at the stats. And mm-hmm. is, is that what it is? Yes, in a way. I mean, the, the thing is, and I think what, what he was saying in the video is there are uh, elements of all this sort of different decision making, but you have to know when is the right type of decision making to make. His kind of <laughs> argument was that, that in design um, and when you're going through the creative process, it's about iteration. It's not about... Um, here's, here's the data. The data says, this is what we should create, so we have created it. There you go. Buy that. It's much more about, right, we think this is what is needed, so let's create that. What do you think? Oh, so you don't like this? You don't like that? Okay, well, let's get rid of that. But you really like this, so we'll keep that. We'll keep that, and we'll build off of that. And then, you know, do you like this? Oh, okay, well, you like this better, but actually this feature was actually better in the old one, so let's go more down that direction. And and it's much more... It's less about going, right, well, it has to... Let's take the phone, for example. It has to have a touchscreen tick. It has to have um, 128 gigabytes hard drive tick. It has to be this speed tick like it's not about that it's much more about well actually what's more what's more desirable so it's kind of taking that sort of lean startup approach in a way Mm -hmm. it's kind of like putting something out there and then gauging the feedback and then using that feedback to kind of influence the decision so say if someone's i think i think maybe even using like buffer as an example like putting out they put out a really simple product Mm -hmm. and then people came back and then they were like okay we like this and so people start saying yeah i invested in it and gave them some money but then over time it's kind of happened where even the other day where i sent them a picture and was like oh i would like this done to buffer mm-hmm. to make it better and now that might send them in another direction it's right. kind of this constant iteration in a way right yeah but th- and this is the thing because you're actually combining you, when you get to that level you've already done the creative process and that's when the data starts coming in because if enough people send to buffer that same thing going buffer being something that you schedule uh, tweets with <laughs> yes um it's it's a web app um yeah so if if enough people then message buffer and go we really like this idea and it's the same sort of idea they've now got data to say oh yeah x amount of people want this or want something similar to this but then once you've got that data right it's not just a case of X amount of people want this, therefore we'll give them this. It then goes back into the creative process, which uh, is, okay. okay, they want something similar to this. Somebody else is doing this, yeah. somebody's asked for, but we think we can do it better. I get you. And then it goes into the creative process again. The other way of doing it is just to go, well, here's an example. Loads more people have sent us this example, so let's just tag that on. I mean beside having various copyright issues <laughs> anyway. But you could just go with that approach and go, right, well, we'll just tag that on. But is that the better approach? Probably not. So then you go into the creative process, which is, okay, how can we make this the best thing that we can make? So you're not solving a problem. I get what you're saying. And you're not, you're not working off of data either. I get you. So basically you're kind of um, focusing firstly that when the customer comes to you or you're testing that idea, the idea out, the customer will come back to you what they want in terms of the value of the product and then you go back and maybe create in a way that they didn't expect but it still kind of ticks the boxes of what they wanted in the first place right maybe in a different way right exactly i mean if you think about henry ford and the ford Mm -hmm. um you know if he always i think it's like it's famous quote i'm paraphrasing Uh it completely but uh you know if he had gone out and asked people what do they want they would have said faster horses yeah (laughs) <laughs> but he didn't create faster horses. He created something entirely different, thought completely outside the box, because he he combined some ideas to produce something better and quote unquote more efficient than a horse. So if someone say got their idea and maybe they've gone to the market, they've created a website and they've seen this demand, or they've asked people, surveyed their audience, or maybe the kind of product that they might need, or the ebook they want to write, or mm-hmm. something like that. Then when it does come back to what would you like you say, I guess the the meat of this sort of episode would be kind of like what happens once you've got that sort of value proposition. Right, right exactly. Yeah, it's 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 kind of also, also like what Steve Jobs says, which is how can people know what they want if they've never even seen it? Which is exactly the situation with the car. Like they'd never seen a car. They'd probably maybe seen a few trains or whatever, but that's a completely different mm-hmm. thing because trains are stuck to tracks whereas this was this complete freedom through a motorized vehicle mm-hmm. so so yeah it's, it's kind of that okay there is a problem but what you're doing with the creative process is you're not solving the problem that's not the issue 
because uh-huh. that's just a big tick box. You, anyone can solve the problem. It's how can you solve the problem in a new, more effective way? And it's that constant striving for, is there a better way to do this? Um, again, it's that going back to the phone thing. You know, is, being a, is having a faster phone actually going to solve the problems that you have with your phone? Is having a bigger hard drive going to solve the problems with your phone? Maybe so, right? But are you more likely to spend money on the phone that actually looks nicer, it functions nicer, with actually a smaller hard drive and not necessarily faster, but because it's been designed so well, it actually runs just as fast as a phone that's got a bigger processor on it, for example. And it's it's that those decision decisions that you then make, which then make all the difference in whatever product, service, whatever you're developing, because you've designed it in such a way that is is optimal rather than ticking the boxes. And then how do you kind of how would you put that together in terms? Is that kind of bouncing ideas off people? Is it because I know mm-hmm. I think I watched the video as well, and I think a lot of it comes down to this idea that you've got to get around people. Who, who know the idea, know the value proposition, and then you kind of throw in bouncing around ideas together. Yeah. And I guess a lot of people who may be listening probably are doing something on their own, mm. have their own idea. Is Would you say it's probably a useful thing to do to kind of get people to understand your tick box, right. that you need the tick boxes you need to to cover, mm-hmm. and then find start just throwing ideas around? Yeah, and I think um, it's something that I actually put in, in the notes for this show, is I, I think creative decision making and a creative process and lateral thinking is very very difficult to do on your own because you've only actually got one perspective yeah that's what i was thinking (laughs) Um, so it is i think it's very important to get at least one other person on board so at least they can go no your idea is shit um and actually this you you've identified the problem yes but actually the solution that you're trying to create is actually the wrong solution entirely mm-hmm. and actually maybe look at this solution and that will change your perspective on what you're actually designing. I guess it's sort of making the most of a sort of like a group mind because if you go and bring in another third person, suddenly you've got this three-way collaboration. And... Right. Well, it's like, uh, look at iTunes, for example. Right, going way back when, uh, when the music industry was completely shaken up, people were downloading music illegally. Um, and so the music industry's solution... What they thought, the problem the problem was how can we get people to buy music? That mm-hmm. was the problem. So the music industry then decided that we have the solution. We can let people buy the music online, therefore solving the problem. But actually what Apple said was, well, actually, no, you've not solved the problem. You've just redirected the problem you've moved the problem from physical sales to digital sales and that's not actually the issue the issue is is people have only got one choice they can buy three songs on a cd or they can buy 15 songs on a cd Uh and if the if the only way to get the one song they want is on the 15 song cd they've got to pay 15 pounds dollars whatever for that one song that's the real problem so the creative thinking there was, well, how about if we just sell them the individual songs online and if they want to buy the whole album, they can buy the whole album. So what you said there basically is that they did need to have some data. So they actually, obviously, they had the usability or they had the trends that they saw in the people who were either downloading this, um, these songs illegally mm-hmm. or the, and they obviously saw that there was people were buying single tracks. They must have had that data somewhere. So I guess when it comes to the create a process is it or is it not good to kind of have some information collect no, think, a certain I think, amount of I think data the data the data is important and i don't want to discredit the data but i mean you can you can make statistics say whatever you fucking want to be perfectly honest um i mean this is without getting too deep into it, this is the problem politics has right and why we're so disfranchised with politics right now because one political party can say oh well the statistics say this and then another party can take exactly the same report and go, yeah, but actually the statistics say this, so we're right and you're wrong. So you can, so data's only good to a point. It's that, it's the difference between knowledge and wisdom, mm-hmm. right? As we've said in our talk, you know, knowledge is uh, knowing that a tomato is a fruit, but wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit cocktail, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's exactly the same thing. Like you can use, you can mine data till your eyeballs are bleeding, but it's no good to you if you're not taking a different approach. Using the music as an example, the music industry had all of that information, um, but they were executing it in the wrong way. And it actually took someone coming from outside the music industry to go, no, this is the real problem. 
and and I think if you can start identifying, it, it's that it's that teamwork and taking different disciplines, combining them together, and that's where the real innovation happens, and that's where the creative process starts to happen, in my opinion. We've got to take a bit bit of a break. Yep. Because it's sponsor thanking time. <laughs> spanking. <laughs> spanking. Sponsor thanking. <laughs> spanking. <laughs> it's spanking time. <laughs> Thank you to our sponsors. Uh, we got two. Yep. Well, three. So many sponsors. So many sponsors. I don't even know where to start. Uh, well, actually, no, I do. I'll start with thanking. We're going to turn into like one of those thanking. nighttime um, infomercials. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start by thanking the University of Northampton who are continuing to support us and support the show uh, so that we can continue to deliver it to you for absolutely free, yep. which is lovely. So thank you to those guys over there. If you are thinking of going to uni, these are the guys to check out. Honestly, I say that as an ex-student, as a graduate. Actually, no, I'm a current student again. Oh, yeah. Uh, studying on a, on a program which is all about business. I'm well jealous that you got a student card again. I know. Although you wouldn't be if you saw the, my photo on it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to Northampton Uni. Check them out. Northampton.ac.uk We've also set up a nice little deal for you with Fiverr. If you don't know what Fiverr is, it's an online creative platform where you can go there and kind of... Find freelancers. You've yeah. got graphic design. You've got audio. You've got all kinds of little creative projects that you need doing. It's literally $5, which is about three quid in the UK. Right. So you don't need a big budget to get a fancy graphic on the top of your website. You can just hop onto Fiverr, fiverr.com, F-I-V-E, double R, dot com. Um, and then look for what you need. And you basically, the offer we've got is that you'll get 20% off your first order, mm -hmm. which makes it even cheaper. So you're probably like two quid. So you can get a nice logo for your website for two quid. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> Nothing to complain about there. So if you want to do that, head over to Fiverr.com. That's with two R's on the end. F-I-V-E-R-R.com. Put in the code PN Podcast, and you'll get 20% off your first order. So. So one thing I was going to say in terms of like decision making, then you kind of need to have some sort of um, boundaries, though. You have to, you can't mm -hmm. just be totally open. So I know you said, right. okay, there's so much data out there, but I guess you do need to have some restrictions. And I think... A thing I heard uh, as well when it comes to people um, being most entrepreneurial is usually kind of when they're pushed into a corner, but yeah. that corner has particular problems. Right. For example, like you might not have a very big budget, so you've only got mm -hmm. 100, 100 quid or something to start up a business, or you've got a nine to five, so you're stuck with only the evenings and the weekends to work on your mm -hmm. project. So what would you say about that? Well, I, I think um, kind of, uh, as you said, you just kind of got to embrace that issue. Um, I'm a, I know I look at um, my production company and we've always very much thrived off of the fact... It, well, thrived is maybe a strong word. <laughs> <laughs> but worked off of the fact that we have got low budget and it's about it's about being inventive with, with as low budget we can. We don't, have a, we don't have a touring van. Like, we're a touring theatre company and we do not have a touring van. Like, how the hell does that work? Well, in our last show that we put together, we made sure that um, all of the set was collapsible into something that you could carry in a bag. We had, we, we essentially, our set was essentially made up of archive boxes, which folded down, flat packed, so you could carry them under your arm. You leave one box open, uh, like actually constructed, and you stick all of your props and costume in that one box, and we toured with that. So that was the creativity part. And that was, <laughs> that was, that was the creative process, because that had to, we had to build that into the show. We had to, th and we had to think, well, what's the show? What do we need in terms of costumes and set? And also, on top of that, we need to be able to tour it without going in a motorised vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> so that was your data, and then that's what right. you guys had to get creative. And, yeah, and so then we designed on that, and then we said, okay, well, we could try this, and what, what about that idea? Well, that won't work because this, 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 and this. I mean, bearing in mind, this was the third show we toured, so we'd already gone through the iterative process of trying to create a really compact set. Well, the and first probably... time we did it was just with like we tried to do it with just six chairs and that was it but actually those six chairs were a real pain in the ass to, to move around the country when you're sat on public transport so that sort of experience was feedback in a way yeah exactly and it's about it's again it's that iterative process it's about right we've tried this it didn't quite work why didn't it work what were the problems okay so we've got that data now how can we then use that and then actually start thinking outside the box, no pun intended, even more so, <laughs> right? And it's, it's, it's about, it, yeah, those limitations are so important to the creative process because I think if you give anyone a blank canvas, 
it becomes far more difficult to actually too many options right right exactly so i guess that to actually just get started really because you in a way are you kind of like searching for the limitations because they're going to push you into a, a corner or is it kind of like we say, if if it's feedback, then it's you might as well just get something going ASAP mm-hmm. because there's gonna then the limitations come straight away. Okay, I've made yeah. I've made a blog, nobody's coming to it. Limitation. Right. Okay, I've put a video on YouTube. My lighting's terrible. You can hardly see my face. Problem, and it kind of exposes right. where you need to take that create process. Yeah, exactly. I mean, once you've once you've identified what it is that you want to create, that's your first limitation. Mm-hmm. I want to I want to create a, I want to create a phone. Right. So we know how phones work now. Is there a better way of doing it? Possibly. Uh, is it actually the way it's being done in terms of a physical product? Fine. Is it the software that's a problem? And then suddenly these questions start being asked. And then you start iterating on those questions and, and bouncing off of those questions. And then you come to more limitations. Originally, I think this is common knowledge now, the actual the iPhone was originally meant to be like the iPod with a dial on it. Okay. They designed many time, many different versions with the dial from the old iPod on it. Mm-hmm. People did love that dial. <laughs> yeah, they did. It was it was one of the selling points of the iPod, but it didn't work on the phone. But that's that was one of the limitations they started with. They were like, well, people recognise the iPod. We want this to be like the iPod. They put that limitation in, and unfortunately, that limitation didn't serve them. So then they went, okay, well, how can we do this differently? And then they thought, right, well, uh, instead of having a physical thing on the on the device let's put it into the software and then that's where the iphone really came from because it was like well hang on we can have a keyboard that can have anything that we want on it so how about we just have one big screen and that is the phone and that's all come from the creative process of going here's an idea it hasn't worked let's try something else here's an idea that hasn't worked let's try something else and it's that that i think is really key and i think that is the real issue that many people have when it comes to being entrepreneurial and even problem solving like, so many people will just go, I can't work this out. I quit. Because there's no clear answer, though, I think, when being yeah. an entrepreneurial. So you, there's no yes, there's no no, there's no right. black or white. I guess you have to, you're in the grey the whole time. Exactly. And I think that's why when people give up on their blog after six months, it's like, well, you're not getting the traction that you want. Are you asking why you're not getting the traction you want? Or are you just saying, I'm not getting the traction that I want? Because I think if you start asking why you're not getting the traction that you want, you may not come up with the solution, but you'll suddenly start experimenting with different things. And it's that exper- experimentation that actually changes things. A friend of mine has just, she sent, she was really excited. She sent me a link to one of her YouTube videos uh, because it had been uh, backlinked from a, quite a popular YouTube blog post and they'd featured her video in an article. And then a couple of months ago, she was being like, oh, I don't know if this is working for me, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, it only takes one person to see it, so just keep creating, try different tactics. Are you being more active on your on your Twitter? Well, I, every time I put a video out there, I post on my Twitter. I'm like, right, so try being more active on your Twitter. But I guess what she could be doing there is saying, well, obviously... I got a load of traffic because somebody's blog, who was obviously popular than mine, decided to put it out there. Instead of just keep creating videos, well, if I just spend that time actually getting my videos on these sort of authority websites, right? which kind of seems like, the okay, there was the problem. The problem is I can create videos every week, but nobody's seeing them. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, there's someone, your limitation. There's your limitation. Suddenly, somebody sees my video, puts it onto their blog post or puts it in their website, and suddenly I get a lot of... Of views. Right. You want more views. That happened when you had that, and then suddenly having that that ability to say, okay, well, that's what I need to do more of. Right, and and then that's when the creative process starts again, because then you start going, right, well, how can I do that in the most effective way I possibly can? Yeah, and then you've got another set of problems. Is okay, each time you approach a new mm-hmm. person, they might say, oh, they might not even get back to you. How do I get creative with my emails? How do I mm-hmm. get their attention? That video obviously got someone's right. attention without the, even the ask. Right, and the thing about particularly online business is that you're having to constantly pivot in this creative lateral thinking way because what happens is people could see very clearly what methods you're using to make things work if you are a success or um, even if like what you're doing wrong. So what happens then is people take the stuff that works and then they all start doing it. And then what happens is everybody starts having this same level of success and so then actually 
that success diminishes because everybody's doing the same thing. It's like you get loads of those sort of like um, blog posts about like how to how to get your website ranked number one or right. how to create the perfect YouTube video, how to right. whatever it is. Exactly. <laughs> and, but then then the game changes because suddenly everybody's up to that quality. So then you've got to try something different to make yourself stand out. Otherwise, you're just going to be in that field of black and white cows and there's no purple cow and you need to be the purple cow. <laughs> It's true, it's true. Is there any sort of like framework for this? Is there any, I know everybody usually has like methodologies or I don't know, is there a way you have to sit together? Is there a certain structure in a way or is it, is it, or is it based on the fact that actually it works best when you don't work to a structure? It's tough actually because the whole nature of it is the fact that you're thinking of new ideas. So it's very difficult to structure that. I think what I would say is um, just keep training your brain is, is it kind of like similar to that idea muscle again kind of like we spoke yeah. to with jams out it's kind of very similar exposing yourself to different things absolutely. and molding them together right absolutely but also i think because because i think lateral thinking is completely uh disconnected sometimes from the creative process for people and lateral thinking being like if you think about riddle solving for example mm -hmm. of quite often the the actual correct answer isn't obvious you've just got to train your brain do puzzle solving like that do uh, riddles and things and try and work them out i think that will get your brain really starting to analyze things read philosophy philosophy mm -hmm. is great for it as well because you then start asking questions because if you read different philosophical theories on different things you'll start going well hang on i don't agree with that because and then yeah. you'll have reasoning behind why it doesn't work for you um and then if you particularly if you can get into a philosophy class where people can start debating with you because then you can start going well I, th that doesn't work for me because this 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 and this um i think of when i did my philosophy class we were arguing for and against the existence of god right and one theory was well god exists because he is the definite we have a definition of perfect and god is perfect and he's the only thing that we can say is perfect and i said well hang on a second who said god was perfect and he's like well he is and he's like no 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 who said he was perfect? Sorry for all the religious people out there, but who said he was perfect? Well, he is. Yeah, but who said? Because from my perspective, we said he was perfect. He didn't say he was perfect. And then that completely, I mean, people will argue against it, but for me, it completely tore the argument apart entirely. It was unvalid because I then started, I questioned something which nobody else was questioning in that class. Yeah, I guess it's just being able to basically ask those sort of what if questions or just to be able to actually, yeah, interrogate what you think is currently held belief. Mm -hmm. I think that's a skill set that, like we say, if you're in schools, we're not right. really taught to kind of right. ask those bigger questions. If the textbook says this and that, if you mix this chemical with that chemical, yeah. you get this. Yeah. Whereas now we're saying actually what we really need is people to be able to just to question that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, as you say, it's that challenging, that pre-existing belief. That, I think that's the fundamental part. It's, it's what exists as a belief and is that necessarily correct? And if it's not, can I disprove it? So a really important little episode there, I think. Nice to have a little bit of a debate going about it. And... I didn't have any idea where we was going to go with that episode, to be honest. I know. <laughs> but it's fine. We got there. Uh, it's really, honestly, really useful thing. As a creative, I think it's super important. It's that ability to not worry about getting it right in the first place, iterating on, on your ideas, taking the data that you've got, and playing around with it, just literally playing around with it in a new way that nobody's thought of before. And I think if you can hack into that, you're on to a winner. So thanks for tuning in, guys. Another Powerful Nonsense episode in the can. We do appreciate you <laughs> tuning in. Um, if you want to play with us between shows, you can do so on Instagram. Powerful underscore nonsense. Jem is in control of that one, so you'll also see plenty of his dietary habits and fitness stuff, which is not so much my thing, even though he has got me playing tennis these days. But there we go. So thanks for tuning in, guys. Hit us up on Instagram, powerful underscore nonsense, and we will see you on the flip side. See you later, guys.